जय राधा माधवा कुंज So this verse in Bhagavad Gita is one of the key verses in the Bhagavad Gita, and it's a long purport. So what we'll do is we'll break it down, and I'm going to be asking you questions, so be ready. Okay. 
Patram Pushpam Falam Toyam Yomi Bhaktya Prayachati Taraham Bhaktya Uparitam Asnami Prayatat Manaha Patram Pushpam Falam Toyam Yomi Bhaktya Prayachati Taraham Bhakti Uparitam Asnami Payatat Manaha Patram Pushpam Falam Toyam Yomi Bhaktya Prayachati Taraham Bhakti Uparitam Asnami Prayatat Manaha Okay, so, patram, a leaf, pushpam, a flower, falam, a fruit, toyam, water, ya, whoever, may, unto me, bhaktya, with devotion, prayachati, offers, Tat, that, that, hum, I, bhakti uparitam, offers in devotion, asnami, accept, prayatma atmanaha, from one impure consciousness. Okay, get ready for the question now. Okay. If one offers me with love and devotion a leaf, a flower, a fruit, or water, I will accept. So what is the key point in this verse that Krishna is making? Hmm? What? Why does he ask for these things? Keep going. <laughs> well, that's right. The key point is love and devotion. But but why does he ask for a leaf, flower, fruit, and water? This is this is because previously he's talking about how to how uh, if you if you worship demigods, how difficult it is. But if Krishna says if you worship me, it's really simple. Just just give me this. If I need love and devotion, I will accept. So it's not these things he wants, right? He wants the love and devotion. So what he's saying that it's insignificant, these things are insignificant, and they're so easily available. And anyone can get any one of these things at any time. So it's not the, it's not the item he's asking for. He's asking for what? Yeah. And he said then, if you do, if you offer these things or any things, that's the whole point, He's showing the most insignificant, easily available, uh, easily securable items to show that the item is not so important, but what is the important part? Love and devotion. And then he says, what? When you, when he, when you do this, he will accept it. In other words, yeah. 
So if the Lord accepts your offering, what what does that mean to you? How does well, what does that mean to you when the Lord accepts your offering? You become happy. Yeah, that's that's true. That's correct. Yeah. What else? Your love increases. Not necessary to love, develop love, but your attraction, your love increases. Yeah, you make advancement on the path. Okay, so very simple but very powerful verse often quoted as a means for understanding the nature of the Supreme Lord because the nature of the Supreme Lord is that you can offer him millions of dollars or millions of whatever you have that seems to be valuable by material standards. He's not interesting. But if you offer him anything with love and devotion, that becomes an offering. Hmm. So that's a key point because this is where Krishna is attractive. Yeah. You'll see actually also well, people who are quite well to do in this world if you do say, if you want to give them something, what can you give them? Everything they have, much more than you do. But if you are affectionate to them or to, to someone that they are affectionate to, like their children or someone, they respond in a, in a, in a very favorable way. So it's the love, it's the concern that makes the offering. <laughs> okay. For the intelligent person, it is essential to be in Krishna consciousness, engaged in the transcendental loving service of the Lord, in order to achieve a permanent blissful abode of eternal happiness. So what are some of the key words in this phrase that we just said? It's a long sentence that Prabhupada uses. What are some of the key words that make up the essence of that first sentence? Yeah, engaged in transcendental loving service, and but in Krishna consciousness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what is the result? Eternal happiness. Not just happiness, but that happiness that is consistent, doesn't break, and doesn't end. Hmm. Now that's powerful. If someone says, I'll give you eternal happiness, you would think, whoa, what do I have to do to get it? <laughs> so, therefore, it says here, to be engaged in Krishna consciousness and in, in service of love to Krishna, you will attain the blissful abode of eternal happiness. Okay, the process of achieving such a marvelous result, Prabhupada emphasizes it, marvelous, that's a very powerful adjective, marvelous. It means something that is wondrous, beyond the norm, uh, creates uh, uh, a type of uh, feeling of something very rare <laughs> is happening. The process of achieving such a marvelous result is very easy. Something very hard becomes very easy. And it can be attempted even by a poorest of the poor without any kind of qualification. So it's easily available. The only qualification required in this connection is to be a pure devotee of the Lord. <laughs> so, very easy, right? To become a pure devotee. <laughs> now there's two kinds of pure devotees. Who can tell me one I'll tell you one kind and you tell me the other one. The other one you may not know. One is that they are freed from all material attachments, attractions, and activities. And they are situated firmly on the transcendental platform in loving service to the Lord. So that's a pure devotee. What is another kind of pure devotee? Yeah, but there is another mood of purity that devotees may not always be aware of, but it leads to the transcendental plan. It leads to spontaneous love. 
How can you be pure and at the same time not be pure? That's the... Can you do that? Ah, thank you. You're not fully purified, but your intentions are pure. Mm -hmm. I want to achieve love of God. I will do whatever is required to achieve it. That is pure intention, which makes you what we so fall into the category of pure devotion. In other words, it's just a matter of time when you reach the purified state. But because you have pure intentions, you'll be moving only in the right direction. Yeah, okay. Okay, so, and, so it requires to be a pure devotee. <laughs> It does not matter what one is, where or where one is, or what one is, situated. So you can be anywhere, and you can be, you know, what you, whoever you are. The process is so easy that even a leaf or a little water or fruit can be offered to the Supreme Lord in genuine love, and the Lord will be pleased to accept it. Can you love someone? What is the qualification or what, what is one of the qualifications, one of them, that allows you to love Krishna? What helps you to love Krishna? Can you love someone without having... Yeah. You have to know about someone before you can love them. Just like we used to use the example quite often in our discussions. Well, uh, somebody will say, well, I have a, a girlfriend. What's her name? I don't know. Where she live? I don't know. Where she do? What she do? I don't know. Uh, what she look like? I don't know. <laughs> so in other words, you have to have some knowledge before your love will actually develop. So learning about Krishna through hearing about Krishna is the way to awaken our attraction for Krishna. And attraction is the first stage of love. Because mm -hmm. without attraction, love doesn't develop. Mm -hmm. So the whole process situates on hearing about Krishna. Mm -hmm. yeah. The Prabhupada's on that platform, so he's already saying, you know, all you have to do is love Krishna. <laughs> but, you know, we have to know something about him before we can love him. Okay. Okay. No one, therefore, can be... A, barred from Krishna consciousness because it's so easy and universal. Prabhupada keeps making the point. It's so easy. Everybody can do it. No requirements. Universal. Adaptable. Marvelous. Who is such a fool <laughs> that he does not want to be Krishna conscious by this simple method and thus attain the highest perfection of life of eternity, bliss, and knowledge? So only a fool will not want to be Krishna conscious. Knowing what is the benefit. If you know what the benefit is, you would think, oh, well, I should try for it because it's, it's the greatest thing that I can achieve. In other words, if you achieve Krishna consciousness, you achieve everything. Any desires, anything you desire in the world, can be fulfilled by achieve, becoming Krishna conscious. Yasmin bhavanti sarva eva bhavanti. Yasmin bhavanti sarva eva bhavan, something like that. If you know Krishna, you know everything. <laughs> and if you know everything and you don't know Krishna, your knowledge is useless. Okay. Krishna wants only loving service and nothing more. Krishna accepts even a little flower from his pure devotee. He does not want any kind of offering from a not devotee. He is not in need of anything from anyone because he is self sufficient. And yet he accepts the offering of his devotee in exchange of love and affection. To develop Krishna consciousness is the highest perfection of life. In other words, you can't attain anything higher than that because once you've become Krishna conscious, 
you become God conscious, everything is situated within Krishna. So everything is achieved by achieving devotion to Krishna. Because when you do that, you achieve Krishna. And when Krishna comes with everything else, <laughs> everything else is included in Krishna. Hmm. Hmm. Let's see. To develop, okay, bhakti is mentioned twice in this verse in order to declare more emphatically, and emphatically means with emphasis, that bhakti or devotional service is the only means to approach Krishna. That's why Lord, Ch that's why Lord Chaitanya says, Harir Nama, Harir Nama, Harir Nama, Eva Keva Lom, Kalon Nasti Eva Nasti Eva Nasti Eva Gatir Anyata. So, not by karma, not by jnana, Nasti Eva, not by karma, Nasti Eva, not by jnana, only by bhakti. That's what that verse means. There's no other way than by bhakti, and the highest expression of bhakti is to glorify the Lord by chanting his holy names. So that verse is saying three times, there's no, not by the karma process or by the jnana process, only by the bhakti process and through the, the essence of bhakti, which is chanting Hare Krishna. It's the highest expression of bhakti and the most satisfying and the most pleasing to Krishna. <laughs> okay. No other condition such as becoming a Brahmana, okay, you're a Brahmana, you're a learned scholar, you can recode so many verses, a very rich man, you can buy so many things and get and go so many places, a great philosopher, you can discuss everything, anything, and come out victorious, can induce, none of these things can induce Krishna to accept some offering. So nothing attracts Krishna except bhakti, no matter what material thing you may have. Without the principle of bhakti, nothing can induce the Lord to agree to anything, to accept anything from anyone. Bhakti is never ca causal. What does causal mean in this context? Yeah, it's not. It's never produced by a certain cause. It it, it is independent within itself. Yeah. Bhakti is never caused by anything. Bhakti comes of its own accord. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the the process is eternal. It is a direct action in service to the absolute whole. So it's also eternal and direct. Here, Lord Krishna, having established that he is the only enjoyer, the primeval Lord and the real object of all sacrificial offers, reveals what time of sacrifices he desires to be offered. If one wishes to engage in devotional service of the Supreme in order to become purified and reach the goal of life, the transcendental loving service of the Lord, then one should find out what the Lord desires of him. Okay, so what does Krishna want from me? Well, he wants your bhakti. But then again, is it, it, the question is, can you give your bhakti easier in one way than in another way? Bhakti is there, it's not causal. causal. Can, can bhakti be expressed easily, easier in one way as opposed to in another way? In other words, is there, is there a better way to show bhakti according to what of the different ways you can show bhakti? Yeah. Well, that's a good answer, yeah. <laughs> I didn't expect that one. 
Now, that's actually, that shuts down all my arguments. <laughs> Yeah, one who says my, is my one who says he's my devotee is not my devotee, but one who says he's the devotee of my devotee is my, actually my devotee. <laughs> That's a verse from the Adi Purana. But another principle is that um, for some people they can express their devotion easier in one type of way as opposed to in another type of way. Uh, but is that true in all all cases and in all for all people? Okay, yeah, that's true. That if one is working according to his nature, naturally it's more easier and, as you say, natural to give devotion. But it's not true in all cases. Because when one makes advancement, then one becomes attracted to Krishna. And it doesn't matter what one does, because the attraction of Krishna becomes the medium as opposed to the service. When we begin Krishna consciousness, we are mostly interested in the service. As we advance, from then we're more interested in Krishna. We start off becoming attracted through the service, but then after a while, the service leads us to developing attraction for Krishna. Then that becomes the motivation, and then one, it doesn't matter what service one does because it's for Krishna. That's on a higher platform. But even if you stay in your own service all the way through, you'll see it evolves from attraction to the service to attraction from to Krishna. Mm -hmm. Usually we're attracted at first to the service, and then we advance, and then we, we, we develop an attraction for Krishna. And the service be, still stays the same, but it becomes more spontaneous and less mechanical, <clears throat> a routine. Okay, you can ask questions as we go along. Mm -hmm. One who loves Krishna will give him whatever he wants, and he avoids offering anything which is under, undesirable or unasked. If Krishna, if Prabhupada used to say, um, please bring me a glass of water. And you come and you give him a glass of milk and you say, Prabhupada, milk is much better than water. Well, he didn't ask for water, milk, he asked for water. <laughs> but you're thinking, well, I'll give him something better. But that's not what he asked for. So here it says, you give them what he asks. Thus, meat, fish, and eggs should not be offered to Krishna. If he desired such things as, as an offering, he would have said so. Instead, he clearly requests that a leaf, flower, fruit, and water be given to him. And he says, of this offering, I accept it. Therefore, we should understand that he will not accept meat, fish, and eggs. So Prabhupada wants to make a point here for those who think they can offer anything. And there are people like that. Whatever else, vegetables, grains, fruits, milk, and water are the proper food for human beings and are prescribed by the Lord himself. Whatever else we eat cannot be offered to him since he will not accept it. Thus, we cannot be acting on the level of loving devotion if we offer some food. So, he, now there's a qualification to the verse to help you understand that Krishna is saying, you can offer these things with love and devotion. But then if anyone says, well, if it's just love and devotion, I'll offer meat with love and devotion. I'll offer fish or or I'll, you know, I'll light up a joint and give let Krishna share a joint with me tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So, because I love Krishna. <laughs> I want to hang out with Krishna. <laughs> but that's not, that's not devotion. That's, that's karma, not even karma. It's less than karma. It's material completely. So, therefore, one should find out what Krishna likes and try to offer him that with love and devotion. Like that. Sometimes there's always been an argument, and is there pizza in the spiritual world? You know? <laughs> and devotees would say, well, you know, you can't offer pizza, but people would otherwise say, hey, there's pizza in the spiritual world. But the Krishna never said, offer me pizza. And we don't hear about any pizza anywhere <laughs> in the Shastras. But then people say, well, it's because it's not there. It doesn't mean, because in the spiritual world, everything is there. So there must be pizza there, too. <laughs> so, the, I mean, these are arguments that devotees got into, you know. I'm serious. This is not just something I made up. <laughs> so, but we want to find out what Krishna likes. Just like well, on Balaram's appearance day, what do we offer him? Huh? Yeah, but... In what form do we have it in? Honey. We offer him honey. Hmm. That's considered the closest thing to Varuni. Because Varuni is a honey liquor. <laughs> it's not just honey, it's honey liquor. But we have to avoid the liquor part. <laughs> so we offer him honey because he likes honey. You know. And Krishna... He likes rasgulas, so if you make nice rasgulas for Krishna and make an offer to him, that's a pleasing offering. Prabhupada said that's his favorite sweet. So if you offer him a mango, especially during mango season, that's a nice offering because Prabhupada said Krishna likes mangoes. And Krishna is a person. He has just like you, you might like one type of food better than another. He also has that desire and taste. <laughs> but when anything is offered with pure love, except for the things that are not offerable, he will accept it. That's the point. <laughs> but if you can find out what he really likes, then the offering is even more better when done, done with devotion. Or if you're thinking... Or if you're thinking, well, Krishna likes this foodstuffs very much, therefore I'll give it to him, but there's not much love and devotion in it, then he won't accept it, even though it's the, his favorite. <laughs> so it's always the love and devotion that makes the difference. Okay, in the third chapter, verse 13, Krishna explains that only the remnants, the remains of sacrifice are purified and fit for consumption by those who are seeking advancement in life and release from the clutches of the material entanglement. So, sacrifice. So what does it mean when to offer something in sacrifice? Well, yeah, that's true. That's partially partially true. In other words, according to the principles that govern the activity of offering, when you follow those principles, then you're then that is considered sacrifice. In other words, the spiritual master teaches you the process for offering. And if you follow that, then those remnants or what is offered becomes the remnants of sacrifice or the remains of sacrifice here. <laughs> those who do not make an, an offering of their food, he says that in the same verse, are eating only sin. Shasha Shusha, what is that verse? Shasha Shusha. Yajya Shasha Shito Shanto 
munchate sarva kilbisa bunchate te agampa pam ye prachatma nakaranat food offered in sacrifice what is that what is the translation Sin, yeah. So that's what Prabhupada's saying here. So sacrifice means offering it according to the principles of offering. <laughs> okay. mm -hmm. In other words, their every mouthful is simply deeping their involvement in the complexities of the material nature. So people are eating every day, but they're getting more and more entangled in the material world simply by eating. Whereas devotees are eating and becoming more and more unentangled or free from the material entangle by the same. Now, so both are eating. But what is eating? What is called? Because God has given us these things, and therefore we have to acknowledge both his proprietorship and his gift. And by doing that, which is the offering we make to him, we are offering sacrifice. So then, as Krishna says in that verse, those who don't do that, they're consuming sin. They're getting the karmic reactions for that. Yeah, so eating is a very big thing because everybody does that every day. <laughs> Sometimes more than once. <laughs> Sometimes more than twice. Sometimes more than three times. Sometimes more than four times. Sometimes more than five times, sometimes more than six times, sometimes more than seven times, but that's usually the limit. First they get up in the morning and then they put something in their mouth, then they have breakfast a little later, something before lunch, and then lunch, that's four, mid-afternoon meal, then supper, that's six, and then before going to bed, number seven. So that's the average person. They eat about seven times a day. <laughs> So don't think, well, boy, I'm missing out on something. <laughs> no, they do. Yeah, that's that's the, their day. They eat about seven times a day, the average person. Mm -hmm. Maybe in between they're chewing gum or sucking on some lozenges. <laughs> they can't control their tongue, so they're either, either talking too much or eating always, either one. Because, as it says, the tongue is the most voracious and difficult to control. So the process of eating food in sacrifice means to help to control the tongue and satisfy the mind. Whereas their food eating doesn't satisfy them and doesn't control their senses either. It makes their senses more wild. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so same process. But one is entangling and the other one is liberating. Mm -hmm. By but preparing nice, simple vegetable dishes, offering them before the picture of the deity or Lord Krishna, and blow, bowing down and pay, praying for him to accept such a humble offering enables one to advance steadily in life, to purify the body, and to create fine brain tissues which will lead to the clear thinking. To clear thinking. So Prabhupada says, yeah, Fine brain tissues are created by prasadam, but specifically by, he said, by milk. By uh, Milk helps to give finer brain tissues. That's why we don't agree with this idea of veganism. Because we know if you take cow's milk coming from the cow that is not being exploited, that milk will benefit you, give you great benefit all, all around. And of course, not too much. <laughs> Like in Nuvrindavan, we had so much milk available that um, at night the devotees would only have milk and popcorn. That was our evening meal. Same thing every night. You know what popcorn is, right? Yeah, okay. So milk and popcorn. So that was it. But then we'd have these big bowls and filled up with this milk, creamy milk coming from the cows, hot and sweet, you know. 
Now the devotees were drinking like, you know, this big, big bowl of milk at night. So after some time, everybody got sick. <laughs> and then Prabhupada came not long after that and said, you're drinking too much milk. <laughs> so then he gave the formula. No more than one pound, no less than one half pound per day. And then he said, that includes all milk products. He says, if you follow that, and then you'll always be in good health. So milk is a health giver, especially, they call it, the miracle food for babies and old men. That's Prabhupada would say that all the time. The miracle food for babies and old men is milk. But now, because we know that the milk on the market is slaughterhouse milk, so the devotees don't take that milk, we take milk that is coming from our cows. That's the principle. And by the year, one year from now, on Gaur Purnima, every temple in Iskan is required to have only a Himsa milk. That's a GBC resolution that was put in effect two years ago. Every temple in Iskan must, by the year 2022, have all all the temples devotees get only him some milk. That means only from our cows. Hmm? There's a plan. Hmm? You mean we have to have a plan? Yes. But doesn't mean mm. Oh, I thought we I thought we maybe I was maybe I'm wrong, but we got our GBC here, he hangs around. <laughs> you could ask him. He knows everything, so I know I'm sure he knows that one too. <laughs> So yeah, um, yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah. Um, I I thought it was the other way. We had it. We were. We had a. I also, I also thought, but then then uh, then was that. You asked Maharaj. No, there's there's one one sentence. Then then the disclaimer. Well, that they're being very lenient because. Well, I guess it'll take that long to develop it. Just like you have here, you have this one lady, Astasaki, and she has cows. So if you could send one or two devotees there to help work there, then you could produce more milk, have enough milk for all the devotees here, and for the deities, everything. You have your source, yeah? Hmm? Hmm? You and who else? Uh, <laughs> you, you can choose who you want to come with you. <laughs> I thought you were a farm boy, no? <laughs> Not a farm boy. You don't look like a city boy, but you... <laughs> Well, you know, it's nice life, <laughs> being on the farm with cows. If you want to be peaceful, just hang around cows. Anybody want to be peaceful? <laughs> Nobody, okay. <laughs> but yeah, so well, I'm sure you'll get some volunteers if, you, if that's the program. <laughs> to go and see. you know, and then you could help with the farm and then at the same time help increase the production there and then take the opportunity to get milk and other products too. Because we can't live in these cities for long. These cities are not going to last. They're already going down. We're seeing the beginning of the, the end of the cities right now. 
everybody thinks it's going to come back up and everything's going to be nice and the grocery store guy is going to be smiling again. <laughs> but it's just some dream. The world is moving in another direction. And uh, as Prabhupada said, that we have to establish these farm communities, otherwise, you know, we won't be able to manage our affairs. <laughs> We have to establish these farm communities. And that, he said this is what, uh, he wanted to do that himself before he left, but he wasn't able to. So that's the future of not only our movement, but the future of the world, because, you know, commercialism, capitalism, exploitation of the earth. You, I mean, you go around the world, you walk into so many stores, and what do you see? Tons of stuff sitting on the shelves all coming from raping the earth, from natural resources, all junk that nobody needs, all coming out of the earth. Now the earth is tired of being exploited. How long can this go on, you know? It's all, all for some economic gain. So these farm communities are the future of our movement, no doubt about that. That's, a, that's what Prabhupada said, so. So either we get it together or, or we'll have to be forced when we have no other alternative. We don't want to be forced. We should be making plans. Because Prabhupada said every, temp every city temple should be connected to one farm community. And that farm community can supply vegetables, fruit, and milk products to the temples. The temples can make nice prasadam. People come, they get the best of all foodstuffs, and simply by eating these things, they become devotees, <laughs> really. Because the food that are grown on our farms by devotees using, you know, natural resources are more nutritious and more tasty than the food you buy in stores, you know. Much better. We haven't really tasted food yet. <laughs> we're, we we sometimes get close to it, <laughs> but when you really the food is actually full of nutrition and nutrients and vitamins and minerals and health giving supplements. And we don't if you eat properly with nice, what we say, a hymns of food, food grown on our farms. You don't need any medicines, <laughs> really. You don't need any medicines. So that's that's our goal: is to create these ideal farm communities. And the Prabhupada said, and for every city temple, there should be a restaurant, and then people come to our restaurants, and then they get a nice experience, and then they want to learn more about devotional life. Okay, so yeah, we're getting towards the end. I'll read a little more. The impersonalist philosophers who wish to maintain that the absolute truth is without senses cannot comprehend this verse of the Bhagavad Gita. Because Krishna says, asnami. Asnami means what? I, I accept, I eat. Whatever you give me, I eat. And when it's done with devotion. To them, it is, it is either a metaphor or proof of the mundane character of Krishna, the speaker of the Bhagavad Gita. But in actuality, Krishna, the Supreme God, has senses, and it is stated that his senses are interchangeable. In other words, one sense can perform the function of any other sense. Angani yasya sakalendri viti manti pasyanti panti kalayanti janangdhaganti ananda chinmaya rasa ananda chinmaya rasa ujwala vigraha govindam maripurusham tamaham bhajami. So sometimes the materialists or the atheists say, well, you're offering food to God, but the food's still there. He's not eating it. But Krishna, Prabhupada said Krishna can eat with his eyes. 
He can eat with any of the senses. <laughs> and because he's merciful, he leaves you something. <laughs> if he wasn't merciful, he'd eat it all and there'd be nothing left. <laughs> I remember in 1996, this was an interesting year in America, and around the world. It was during the Chaturmasya time, it was in the month of September, and uh, devotees were offering milk on the altar. And this was happening not only in our temples, but in tem other Vishnu temples around the world. And the milk was being drunk. And there was reports coming in from everywhere, the deity is drinking the milk. So they would put the milk in and then they'd go away and come back and the cup would be empty. Yeah, really. So this was many reports. So I remember I was sitting in the Chicago temple and I was sitting in our one of the rooms we have. It's a guest room like. So one ga Indian man came in and he was all excited. Oh, miracle, miracle. The God is eating, he's eating. So I said, I said to him, well, he eats every day, <laughs> but this time he's not so merciful. <laughs> he's not leaving you any. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, so for, for the non-believers, they need the miracles. <laughs> but for the devotees, they know Krishna can eat with any of his senses, and therefore, in He's, he's accepting, there's no question. This is what it means to say that Krishna is absolute. Lacking senses, he could hardly be considered full in all opulence. In the seventh chapter, Krishna has explained that he impregnates the living entities into the material nature. This is done by his looking upon material nature. So simply by glancing over the material energy, he impregnates the energy with the living beings. And so, in this instance, Krishna, hearing the devotee's words of love and offering footsteps, is wholly identical with his eating and, and is actually tasting. He's actually tasting. This point should be emphasized because of his absolute position. His hearing is wholly identical with his eating and tasting. Only the devotee who accepts Krishna as he describes himself we take Krishna the way he wants us, not the way we think he should be. Bhagavad Gita, as I see it. That's my edition. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just wrote a new Bhagavad Gita, as I see it. <laughs> Who cares? I was sitting on the plane one time, and I was, it was in India. So I met some gentlemen. There was two gentlemen, one sitting next to me, one sitting next to him on the other side. They're both Indians, so. So I got in conversation with the one next to me. He was very, very friendly, very nice. Nice guy, sweet. And then we were talking. Finally, he came out with this Bhagavad Gita by his guru. <laughs> and he said, my guru, he, you know, he wrote an interpretation of Bhagavad Gita showing the glories of Lord Shiva through Bhagavad Gita. He said, this is really interesting. Would you like a copy? I have an extra one. <laughs> you know, after being so sweet and nice to me, now he's got me under the Panchatattva <laughs> Ki So I was thinking, Krishna, you have to get me out of this one somehow. <laughs> so I prayed to Krishna, Krishna gave me a... And I said, thank you very much, but I'm sure you can find better use for that because I have so many books that I have to read and therefore I may not get to it for a while, but thank you very much for your offer. <laughs> and then I left it at that. And there was no use in trying to, to, to discourage him or defeat him because it wouldn't have did any good. You know, I could see that he was so attached to his guru's interpretation of Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> so, what to do? <laughs> well, he was a nice man. Only devotee who accepts Krishna as he describes himself without interpretations can understand that the supreme absolute truth can eat food and enjoy it. <laughs> He's a person.
He's a person. Okay, that's the end of the purport. And okay, now we can begin class. Om Namo Bhagavati <laughs> Vasudevaya. <laughs> Okay, any, any final statements on anything? This is a very important verse. Try to read it over. Uh, you'll understand the nature of Krishna when you simply by reading this verse in purport. And the more you understand about Krishna, the more you become Krishna conscious. I did this this afternoon for my class, so I thought I thought maybe I'd say something different tonight. I don't know. <laughs> okay. I got sidetracked, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe backtracked. <laughs> <laughs> I spoke on them today. We went through some more of those principles. I have a class tomorrow night. You want me to speak on him tomorrow night, or as you wish, hmm? as you desire. It's, it's, I, I just no, 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 mention no, no, because no. That's, that's not that's not the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Give me another answer. <laughs> no, I just uh, because yesterday you mentioned that you have for two days. That's why I just I just repeat. Oh, okay. Yeah, you're you're, you're making sure that I stay true to my word. <laughs> Not necessary. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So yeah, I did that. I did two days with my conference devotees. So I thought I'd yes, yes. do Bhagavad Gita tonight for some reason. <laughs> because when I do these classes, I can ask you questions, mm. and then I feel like the class has more substance. When I speak about others, I do just speak, and then at the end of the class. Everybody looks at me and says, Okay, Maharaj, say all glories to Prabhupada now. <laughs> so, so I, you know, I want to include the devotees in the discussions because it's nice. It really helps to bring out the points, you know. And that's that's good. When we discuss the philosophy, it becomes more and more uh, available, understandable. There's points we bring out that we don't know until we discuss it. Bodhiyantas parasparam katiyantas chamam nityam tushanticha ramanticha. Okay, so thank you very much. Okay, here you go, the magic word. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Srila <laughs> Prabhupada ki jai. Hare Krishna. 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 Hare